A boy was so obsessed with bugs, he needed to catch them all. He started collecting all kinds, and it eventually inspired him to create his own universe, Pokemon. Today, it is by a long shot the biggest video game franchise in history. But for a time, the company that made it was struggling to even pay its staff, and a mistake caused the franchise to almost never exist. This is the story of how Pokemon was made. On August 28, 1965, Satoshi Tajiri was born to a Nissan salesman and a housewife in Machida, a rural suburb of Tokyo. As a child, he spent his time hunting and collecting bugs, a hobby that earned him the nickname Dr. Bug from other kids. The nickname wasn't out of place as Satoshi dreamt about becoming an entomologist, but as time went on, his interests changed as did the town around him. As the years passed, Machida became more and more urbanized. Trees were cut down, fishing ponds were replaced by arcades, and the bug populations decreased as their habitats were destroyed. When Satoshi was a teenager, his enthusiasm for bug hunting was replaced with enthusiasm for video games. He spent his time at arcades so much so that he cut classes to play games and nearly failed to graduate high school. In fact, he was such a frequent customer that one arcade gave him a Space Invaders machine to take home. His parents worried that he had become a delinquent. Satoshi never attended university, but instead studied electronics for two years at a technical school. His obsession with arcade games eventually led him to create Game Freak, a homemade arcade magazine at the age of 17. He would visit arcades for the handwritten and stapled together publication, speak to their owners, and write about tips and cheat codes for arcade games. One of these early issues caught the attention of another key figure in the rise of Pokemon, Ken Sugimori. Ken joined the fan magazine as an artist, contributing his iconic style to Game Freak's illustrations. He and Satoshi quickly became friends, working on the magazine together until wrapping up the magazine four years after it began. It wasn't the end for Game Freak though, just a metamorphosis. Ken and Satoshi spent the next three years studying programming to chase a dream, and then remade Game Freak. But this time, they weren't just writing about games, they were making them. While the two didn't believe they could make an arcade game, they saw an opportunity in the Nintendo Famicom, which had launched six years prior. Their first game, Quinty, was made as a hobby, it was a puzzle game where players flip tiles to avoid and dispose of enemies while trying to rescue the main character's girlfriend. Development was unusual. While most game companies made titles using official development kits, Game Freak didn't have access to one. Instead, they hacked their console and learned how to unofficially develop for it. Nintendo wasn't interested in a game by a bunch of hobbyists, so Satoshi began shopping the game around. Namco, a Japanese publishing company, took interest in the title. However, they weren't willing to deal with individuals, leading to Game Freak Incorporating. After breaking into the industry, Game Freak began making games for larger companies. Their next title, Smart Ball, released two years later under the Sony banner for the Super Famicom, or Super Nintendo. That same year, they began working with Nintendo directly, releasing the puzzle game Yoshi for the Game Boy. The next few years saw a number of other releases from Game Freak. Two years after launching Yoshi, they released Mario & Wario for the Super Famicom. They also briefly worked with Nintendo's main rival, Sega, releasing the platforming game Pulseman for the Sega Mega Drive a year later. But all the while, Game Freak had been working on a massive project that would soon overshadow all the others. By approaching Nintendo back when they first began developing games, Satoshi had opened a door with the video game giant. The following years, and Game Freak's later releases on Nintendo consoles only served to strengthen the ties between the two companies, and led him to become friends with Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario and Gunpei Yokoi, inventor of the Game Boy. 
A year after Game Freak had released Quinty, Satoshi had been struck by inspiration. Spotting a pair of Game Boys linked together by a link cable, a device that allowed the handheld consoles to network together, he began imagining insects crawling up and down the wires. Remembering his childhood hunting bugs, Satoshi came up with a game idea where players could explore, collect creatures like the Gashapon capsule toy machines, and trade them with each other. Pitching the game was nerve-wracking though. Satoshi was afraid that the executives at Nintendo wouldn't get the concept, and he had been told that they'd reject it outright. But even with his doubts, he still brought the idea to the house that Mario built. Just as he'd fear, when Satoshi first pitched the idea to Nintendo, they weren't sure about the idea. However, the executives relented and gave Game Freak the go-ahead to get working on it. Shigeru Miyamoto not only backed the idea, but he also took Satoshi under his wing and acted as a mentor to the younger game developer. Game Freak had been given the chance to make the game of Satoshi's dreams. Now all they had to do was survive long enough to release it. Pokemon's development was a troubled one. Game Freak almost went bankrupt during the development cycle and the company had to take on work for other companies in order to make ends meet. Not making matters any better were the Unix computers that Game Freak were developing the games on. The computers crashed often, and four years in, one crashed so badly that the programmers couldn't recover the machine. And that particular machine happened to have all the data for the game all the Pokemon, and the main character. According to Junichi Masuda, composer and one of two programmers for the original Pokemon games, it felt like if they couldn't recover the data from the computer, the game was finished. He had to look up English manuals for the computer in order to get the data back. On top of unreliable machines, Game Freak also lost staff over the course of development, and the staff that did stay had to work without pay due to the financial troubles that Game Freak was facing. But as the years passed, Game Freak saw the light at the end of the tunnel, only for another issue to loom over them, threatening the success of the project. Enjoying this story so far? Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get more fascinating stories about today's biggest companies. After six years, the Game Boy had lost much of its popularity in the Japanese market. Others in the industry were questioning how good an idea it was to launch Pokemon for the console, saying that it wouldn't sell very well. With release fast approaching, the team began debugging the game, making sure that everything worked properly. After this, the team was instructed to not add anything else. However, the debugging process opened up 300 bytes of space on the game cartridge, just enough to add Pokemon number 151, Mew. Monster designer and programmer Shigeki Morimoto had included Mew as an Easter egg, a secret hidden Pokemon in the game. Originally, he intended to only let developers have the Pokemon unless they could find some kind of post-launch event to include it as. However, due to a glitch, Mew also appeared occasionally in regular games. Then, Pokemon launched as two titles, Pokemon Red and Green. For a while, the team was kept in limbo with no indication of how well the games were even selling. So, they travel out to game stores to see how it was being received. At first, Pokemon launched to only a modest reception, but soon, word of the game spread through word of mouth and sales spiked, partially thanks to rumors of a hidden Pokemon in the game. Even before Pokemon spread outside of Japan, it was already becoming a franchise. Later that year, the Pokemon trading card game was released in Japan by Media Factory, the card game had the same addictive collectability to it, containing not only cards of popular Pokemon, but also rare foil versions. It also helped that the game was both fun and competitive. Pokemon wound up selling millions of copies in Japan, and then launched in the United States two years later as Pokemon Red and Blue. 
Despite concerns that Game Freak had over whether a turn-based role-playing game would attract an American audience, Pokemania spread to Game Boys nationwide all the same. The trading card game made the jump across the Pacific a few months later, published by Wizards of the Coast, the same company behind another hit card game called Magic the Gathering. The cards exploded in popularity just like they had in Japan. Satoshi didn't realize it, but he hadn't just created a game, he had made a pop culture phenomena. Kids took to it in a frenzy, and some became obsessed with it. What Satoshi also didn't realize was that it would pull his company to new heights before dragging it down. Since launching three years prior, Pokemon had expanded beyond just a pair of games released for Nintendo's aging Game Boy console. It had become a trading card game, a hit anime, and a line of popular merchandise. Pokemon was more than just a media franchise. It was a way of life. But the series' meteoric rise among children worldwide was brewing up a storm of trouble aimed right back at Satoshi's dream game. Pokemon flu had infected the world, and parents were becoming worried. The sight of children with handfuls of Pokemon cards was becoming commonplace at schools throughout the world, leading to concerns about how the game was impacting children's ability to learn. Those concerns, along with other issues like children without Pokemon cards feeling left out, and children prioritizing the cards over eating lunch, resulted in principals banning the cards from schools outright. Some parents feared that the buying and trading of Pokemon cards was similar to gambling. A group of parents in New Jersey even sued Nintendo, believing that the card rarity was like racketeering. It wasn't just the trading cards that caused controversy though. The animated series encountered a number of issues as well. Famously, one episode with flashing red and blue lights caused seizures in 685 children across Japan. Another episode was barred from air on America television due to a character threatening 10-year-old protagonist Ash Ketchum with a firearm. But there was another controversy coming out of America. Someone called and said, is Pokemon demonic? The answer to that is yes, they are all oriental demons. Just like other pop culture phenomena before it, Pokemon was the subject of its own satanic panic. Fundamentalist Christian groups claimed that Pokemon were demonic in nature and were corrupting the youth. Others took issue with Pokemon evolving into new forms, believing it was a way to teach children Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. But no matter how many controversies struck Pokemon, nothing seemed able to keep its appeal down. When Pokemon, the first movie release a year after the games reached America, it was an instant success and brought in more than 160 million at the box office. The same year, a special edition of the first Pokemon games called the Pokemon Yellow was released. It gave the player a Pikachu as their starter Pokemon, just like in the animated series. But it wasn't just expansions on the original game. Pokemon games were spreading far and wide. The same year that Pokemon Yellow released, a game called Pokemon Snap launched on the Nintendo 64. In Snap, instead of catching Pokemon, players captured photos of their favorite Pokemon and got high scores based on posing and shot composition. The next year, a slew of Pokemon games was unleashed on an audience hungry for more. Pokemon Stadium launched in America on the Nintendo 64 and let players use their Pokemon teams from the Game Boy games in 3D. There was also a Pokemon puzzle game, Puzzle League, and a game that came with a microphone to let players speak to their very own Pikachu and go on adventures, Hey You Pikachu. And on the Game Boy Color, there was a video game version of the Pokemon card game and the next generation of Pokemon, Gold and Silver. The new games brought players to a new region, with new Pokemon to catch, new gyms to beat, and in a move that caught many by surprise, once the main game was completed, the region from the original Pokemon games would be unlocked for players to revisit, along with a hidden encounter with the player character from Red and Blue. 
The new Pokemon game sold over 20 million copies, and the franchise has only grown since. A year later, Gold and Silver were joined by Pokemon Crystal, which added new legendary Pokemon to the game, and gave players the choice between a boy and a girl character. In the following years, Ruby and Sapphire, Fire Red and Leaf Green, and Emerald were released for the Game Boy Advance. Then, Diamond and Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver were released for the Nintendo DS. Afterward, X and Y, Omega Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire were released for the Nintendo 3DS. Of course, there were more titles released every year, side games and side games included, meaning that no fans of the series had to go without something new for long. New sets were also released for the card game and were being published by Nintendo instead of Wizards of the Coast. But two years after the Ruby and Sapphire remakes, a new Pokemon game launched that changed everything. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. Go was a phenomenon in its own right and drew players across the world to a game where they could catch Pokemon in the real world. At its creation, Satoshi had envisioned Pokemon as a game where its players could experience the hunt for bugs in the wilderness. Now, they were living it. Within months, Pokemon Go had built up a user base of over 200 million players and had made $207 million in its first month alone. Players of all ages took to the outdoors in order to find and catch their favorite Pokemon. People were obsessed. Until they weren't. As the summer ended, so did Pokemon Go's player base, dropping to under 50 million by the end of the year. One issue that led to Pokemon Go's rapid decline was players being disappointed in a lack of features. At launch, the game had no way to battle other players except for limited gym battles, and the game's developer Niantic was slow to add new features and even remove some popular features from the game. A disastrous Pokemon Go Fest the next year didn't help anything. Hosted in Chicago, the event was meant to be a place for Pokemon Go fanatics to meet and catch legendary Pokemon, but the 20,000 people proved to be too much for the local cell phone networks and game server crashes left a sour taste in the mouths of many attendees. The situation grew so poor that the CEO of Niantic was booed on stage with shouts of Fix the game coming from the crowd. Help me welcome to the stage the CEO of Niantic, Mr. John Hankey. Thanks, Rachel. But Niantic didn't give up on their Pokemon title, and over the years drew players back to the game by adding in much requested features and hosting new events. While they still haven't reached the popularity level they started at, Pokemon Go broke 1 billion in annual revenue four years after launch, an over 20% increase compared to its first year. Then, just as COVID began forcing people inside, a new Pokemon phenomena rocked the world. Many who found themselves spending their entire days at home began looking for things to do and turned to Pokemon as a familiar and fun way to pass the time. Among those who turned to the familiar old feeling of Pokemon trading cards were live streamers like Logan Paul, Steve Aoki, and rapper Logic, who all began buying up boxes of booster packs and opening them live with hundreds or thousands of followers, watching and sharing in the excitement of getting a rare card. Videos of the streams went on to garner millions of views and further excite fans about picking up the trading card game. With the increased demand for Pokemon cards, prices have increased too. Rare cards like an original basic set Charizard have skyrocketed in price from 16,000 to 300,000. The surge in prices has been great news for card collectors who are now earning millions off the sales of Pokemon cards, getting rich practically overnight. Of course, the Pokemon video games haven't slowed either. The same year that Pokemon Go took over smartphones worldwide, Pokemon Sun and Moon released, followed by yearly releases of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, Sword and Shield, expansion packs for Sword and Shield, and remakes of Diamond and Pearl. 
Since then, the open world Pokemon Legends Arceus released to popular reviews and a new series of games, Scarlet and Violet, have been announced. No matter what happens, one thing is for sure. Pokemon is here to stay. Today, Pokemon is the highest grossing franchise of all time, surpassing even Star Wars, Marvel, and Mickey Mouse as it brings in 100 billion in sales. As for Satoshi, he continued to be heavily involved with the direction of the franchise and is widely known as one of the top game creators in the world. This is the story of how a bug-obsessed kid who spent his high school day skipping class to play games in his local arcade created a game that changed the world. For more interesting stories about today's biggest brands, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.